Angelo, sales rep for Bionic, with OrthoHeal Technology. Been with the brand for uh, about two and a half years now. And I was with Fitflop before that for five years, the Fitflop brand and the uh, brand Puma for eight years prior to that. So it's uh, it's excited to be a part of Bionic and the good thing that's going on, obviously, in the stores. You can see, uh, you know, the product that's starting to live for spring. Very excited about that. This weather eventually will break. We will have a spring, I promise you. One on break. that side, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But uh, all very good. You know, products are great. Sales have been very, very good. Um, so we're excited on that side. Uh, what we've added to assist you and me uh, and the brand is Mr. John Lee standing next to me. Um, John recently relocated about three months ago from Australia. Um, he's been in the business industry for many, many years. He's written 11 books on business, a prominent author on that, uh, on that side too. So he's. Um, Special guest contributor, sales development for the company's independent retail customers, which is definitely uh, Holly Lane. So uh, John left uh, Australia, as we said, to join Bionic in the U.S. three months ago. Uh, I'm going to turn over to him now. We do something real quick called the PS Club. So when you see PS Club, uh, which stands for Progressive Shoeys, it's on some of the handouts I'm going to give you. After John goes over the ideas and the concept, you'll understand and we can talk more about that, the PS Club, but it's something that Bionic is doing now. There's really no other retailers in the industry that are doing this. So again, John is heading that as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Lees. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. I want to say thank you to Frank, because uh, he sort of made it all happen in the background. So thank you, Frank. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, the next 12 hours. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly what it is because I'm not organized. But uh, no, we've got a couple of hours together, have we not? Yeah. So it's a pleasure to be here. Frank speaks very highly of this organization and the people in it. Um, yes, yeah, so originally my wife and I are from the UK. And why did we go to Australia? Well, my brother was the first to go. Um, he was in the Royal Marines in the UK, became unsettled when he left, announced that he was getting married. Uh, at a registry office, announced that he was going to live in Australia. So he went to Australia and wrote glowingly about Australia. Then my sister went eight years after that. And then one year after that, my parents went to Australia. And, you know, I was beginning to wonder where everyone was. <laughs> because I think they could have said something. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so we made our way to Australia. We had only just got married that point. Um, my wife's mother had become a widow, which was sad, but the positive side of that was she was able to come with us, which as you can imagine made life much easier for, for my wife. Uh, my wife's mother was a test pilot in a brewery factory. Um, no, 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 she was no, she was, she was, she was a very nice lady. I love that. She was a very nice lady. So we moved to Australia in our early 20s, it doesn't seem like 10 years ago, but anyway, it is. Um, so we lived, uh, we lived our lives in Australia. Uh, three children, three Aussies, um, all girls, except for two. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So yeah, as Frank said, we came here. I've been working with the company on a consulting basis for a couple of years. And uh, what we're doing is we're contributing so, so you've got, really you've got two sides of anybody's business. One is distributing, you know, having access to products, and the other is contributing. So contributing is more the human factor in business. And you know, I don't know of any business that can't do more for its customers, and, and will need to do more for its customers in the, in the future. But the, the problem is the customers never ask for any additional help. You know, they don't know that they need additional help. As with the Bionic brand or any kind of help that you can give to a customer, they just don't know. And if they did know, there'd be no need for us. So working with the company a couple of years, and then, as Frank said, we moved here in December. So try moving to another, you know, getting the social security numbers, getting IDs, you know, getting a driver's license, because I can't. Uh, we live in California, so uh, I, can't, uh, I can't own a car unless I've got a driver's license. Or, you know, it's just one thing after another. You've got you to adapt to and so forth. But anyway, we've been learning to adapt, so there you go. And then, two Fridays ago, our stuff arrived from Australia, a big container of stuff, because we sent it on December the 15th, and you've heard about all the stuff held up at the docks? Uh -huh. Yeah? 
Well, our, our tiny container, relatively speaking, was held up as well. So I was delighted that it arrived, especially as I had missed my wife enormously. <laughs> 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 You've got to cut back. No, so well, she was delighted. And, uh, so, yeah, so we're settling into life uh, in America, learning the American way, very impressed, generally speaking. Anyway, so today the idea was that we'd have a talk about business. And I, I'm, you know, you, I, I'm just a student of business. I'm not a teacher of business. I am what I hope you are. I hope you're a, a learner, someone who's keen to learn. We're going to spend all our lives in business, by the way. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> all our lives. Um, and some people say, well, what does that mean? You know, I'm hoping to retire one day. No, 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 you, you can do that because that's your decision. Uh, but you can never leave the world of business because we live in a sort of a business society. I don't mean it's the most important thing in our lives, but it's a very important part of our lives. So, for instance, if you do retire, you will remain a customer of other businesses, will you not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll have an interest in how business is conducted. You will have or you will have children already and grandchildren, they will inevitably go into the world of business. So what are you going to do about that? Are you going to, are you going to help them to have a better attitude about business? Or are you going to tell them, get in, make a buck and get out? And that's what a lot of people do. Someone said to me recently, the main reason I'm in business is so I can make money. I said, oh, okay. For what reason? Uh, so I can get out of business. <laughs> that's heartening to hear. So that's the kind of nonsense that you hear, you know, that we're going to be in business all our lives. Okay? Now, the basis of your business is to help me, and the basis of my business is to help you. I hope you don't you know, contra uh, complicate it more than that. The only real question, and we'll examine this today, is what does help mean? Because it isn't simply having shoes. It isn't simply being prepared to give service, because the consumer believes they can get that anywhere. And in fact, that is an entitlement of theirs. They can get it anywhere. The question is, how do you help them in areas where they don't ask for help? And I don't mean to getting involved in anything complicated. I mean. You know, is it possible that what consumers need is different to what they say they want? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'll repeat the question. Is it possible that they need help beyond what they say they want? Yes. yes. Okay, well, that's a good organization studies that on an ongoing basis. And I don't mean it's the same for everybody. It's not the same for everybody. But the same principle applies is that people need help. Now, if you go to the doctor, the doctor knows you don't know, don't they? They know that you don't know. They know that all you have to talk about is a symptom. That's it. Tell me when the last time you went to a doctor and said, hello doctor, my left ventricle is malfunctioning. <laughs> also, uh, my liver is interacting negatively with my kidney. Uh, the lower lobe of my left lung doesn't feel right. And guess what, doc? My esophagus is just picked up, packed up. You can't speak that language. And they know you can't speak that language. You speak the language of symptoms. So the only kind of thing that you can say is, doctor, yes? Every time I do that, it hurts. Don't do that, not yours. <laughs> so, so today, uh, in the short time that we've got, we're going to examine uh, people, people at the basis of business, whether they're managers, staff, part-time, full-time, people at the basis of business. We're going to study consumers, they're people too, are they not? Mm -hmm. yes? yes? Or do they go home at night to consumer land? Yes. No, okay, so they're people too. And uh, we'll start with just a basic look at people in business. So people in business form themselves into a human pyramid. So, so there's all the people in business. And you are in there somewhere, and I'm in there somewhere. <clears throat> That's the human pyramid. Then you get to see all of the results generated by people. Now when I say results, what most people think I mean in business is dollars and cents, and that's obviously a key result. That's not the first result, okay? There are four results that I think any business ought to be concerned about. The first result is our customers getting more out of us every year than they did the year before. This means that you're in the business of progress. You're not in the business of change. So don't talk about change because it bores the pants off people. Um, they're not interested in change. They're only interested in progress. Oh, and by the way, the good news is you can't have progress without change. So progress is the goal, change is the strategy. You know, we don't go around talking about strategy before we talk about a goal. So you know, in other words, you either want to get better or you don't. If you want to get better, then you're going to have to change. But if on the other hand, you just talk to people about change, you threaten to rearrange what they've become comfortable with. 
So don't do that. Don't do it with customers, don't do it with staff. So the first result in any business is, do customers get more out of us every year than they did the year before? Now, if that doesn't happen, then you will have two problems. Number one, you will not make the level of sales and have the level of patronage that you want. And number two, there'll be no complaints from the customers because they don't know anything about this rule. Nothing. If they get it, if they get more out of you, they love it. They will spend more, they'll come back, and they'll send other people to see you. But if they don't get it, they won't complain, okay? Because they don't know what it's all about. It's not their job to know what it's all about. It's our job. So that's the first result in any business. Second result is that the staff of the business will succeed one way or the other. Uh, they have to succeed. The whole idea of having an entrepreneurial spirit, if that only exists with management, but not with staff, then it's laughable as far as I'm concerned. So in a good business, one way or another, the staff, no matter what they do, by the way, whether they're on the floor, background, doesn't matter, the staff have an opportunity to be successful where they are, not where they might be in the future. In most businesses, and nobody means for this to happen, the only way for staff to get on is to get out. To get out of the job they're in or to get out of the company they're in because enough value isn't placed on that person. That's ridiculous if you think about it. In a good business, a person can get on in the job that they're in. If they do a better job, if they produce better results, etc beyond the job description and so forth. Third result is that the business does very well in terms of reputation, sales, profits, etc., market share, whatever, whatever matters to you. And, uh, and uh, the, the fourth result is that you just simply you know, keep on getting better as a team, etc. Well, on a day like this, we are reminded that very few people and very few businesses generate most of the results. I'm sure that's not a big surprise. I'm not talking about big business up here, by the way. I'm just talking about progressive businesses. So here you've got very small businesses, medium-sized businesses, some very large businesses exist up here. Many large businesses in America and all over the world reside at the base of the pyramid. Don't make any money at all. They're an embarrassment from a service point of view. Hopeless. So, you know, big business isn't necessarily a successful business. So here you have some very, you have one-man bands here, all the way up to small, medium, large businesses and so forth. These people are fat, thin, tall, small, young, old, female, male, different colors, different ethnic backgrounds. There's absolutely nothing external about these people that would give you to understand why they are successful. It's an internal job, or as we said for today's title, success is an inside job. It is for individuals and it is for a business too. So some of these people were very fortunate to go to university. Some of them left school at a tender age, but they remain students of business all their life. They're always learning. Not for the sake of learning, but for the sake of passing in information on. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put some emphasis on it. You heard the saying, knowledge is? Oh, oh, there you go. It never has been and never will be. I, I know we've been told that, but you know, not everything we've been told is true. I don't mean anybody meant to tell us lies, but there's a lot of nonsense in business and life. N knowledge is not power. Giving knowledge is power. Okay, That's power, not having it. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to those you serve, inside the business or outside the business. Giving knowledge is power. So now, if you buy that, if you buy that idea that giving is knowledge, and don't tell me you don't understand that principle, or I'll have you analyzed. <laughs> because you already know about it if you've got children, yes? Do you hold back from giving knowledge to children? No. no. You give knowledge to children. If you give knowledge, then the next question is, what kind of knowledge do you give? That raises a very important point. What kind of knowledge do you give? Do you give basic product knowledge, or do you give knowledge that will help the individual, the person? How do you give the knowledge, which is the art of communication? How are you going to give the knowledge? You can't say to someone, uh, do you have time to talk about this? What will they say? No, so that's the end of that. So you can't, you stop from giving knowledge. Don't ask permission to do your job. If you've got valuable knowledge to give to people, don't ask permission to do it. Get on with it and do it. I don't mean to impose yourself on people, but give the knowledge in an interesting way. <laughs> so, so these people here are givers of knowledge. Um, they, uh, as I said, are, you know, in every, every way they're completely uh, different. Uh, some of these people are uh, very outgoing in personality, you know, very gregarious and confident and what have you. But most of the people I meet up here, very seriously, 
very quiet people. They just don't need to be noisy because they're valuable. See, once you're valuable, you don't need to be noisy. You don't need to go around you know, with the gift of the gap, all the nonsense that goes on in sales. Because I was raised in sales, and basically the message to me was, I'd better be jumpy, I'd better be noisy. Hi there, how you doing? You know, all this kind of nonsense. Like as if that's gonna impress a customer. I had a salesperson come to see me in the business that I had in Australia, only a small business, 4.2 billion a year, just small. And uh, I had this guy come to see me, a salesman, and he was something to do with office appliances. And this is how he started. This is what selling can be like if you're not careful. First of all, he had an Australian accent. Are you familiar with the Australian accent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's like that, you know? Yes. <laughs> Too right. Anyway, um, so he said, uh, G'day, Mr. Because that's how Australians. G'day. G'day. Uh, listen, um, got a question for you. What do I have to do to get your business? What an interesting question that is. What do I have to do to get your business? I said, would you mind repeating it? He said, yeah, what do I have to do to get your business? I said, okay, so let me see if I've got this right. You've got no ideas then. <laughs> <laughs> so you have no ideas on how to get my business. So you basically want me to tell you how you can get my business. What an interesting line of thought. Will I be paid a commission on this sale to myself? <laughs> <laughs> you idiot. So this is what selling is, it's empty, it's empty. But let me introduce you to a saying that I found many years ago. Unless some sweetness at the bottom lie, who cares for all the crinkling on the pie? Mm. So a person's personality and what have you is really just the crinkling. What they want to know is, can you be valuable or not? Now to simplify this, most of the doctors you've ever met, are they noisy or quiet? Quiet. quiet. They don't need to be noisy, <laughs> okay? They know what they're talking about, and they give their knowledge. Have you also noticed that when you go to the doctors, they don't say things like, oh, uh, by the way, um, would you like your blood pressure taken? <laughs> Are you in the mood? <laughs> do you have time for it? How do you feel about the concept of blood? They don't do that, what do they do? Take your blood pressure. They take your blood pressure, okay? That's the end of that. So you've got a job to do, do it, okay? If it's designed to help people, do it. But in most businesses, it hasn't been designed. In most businesses, the standard of service is based on the person who's giving the service. Okay, so you could have eight people giving service and they've got eight different standards. Oh, that's very bad. And the worst thing you'll ever hear in any business is where someone in sales or any kind of business says, usually in a conspiratorial whisper, um, I've got my own way of selling. Is that why you're 30% behind? So you have to be very careful about that. Good business set standards. You sell shoes that have been made to a standard? Yes? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so then have service that's made to a standard. I don't mean I don't mean clinical boring standards. I mean very interesting standards. The higher the better. So these people also understand the dictionary definition of the word winning, which of course is known to all athletes but not to many business people. The dictionary definition of the word winning is progress through struggle. It isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be tough, okay? It's like anything. Being a parent, piece of cake? No, it's tough. Being married, tough. Well, I ought to know. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere we go, I introduce my wife as my first wife, just to keep her on her toes. <laughs> <laughs> so, progress through struggle. However, I would add an additional word to that progress through enjoyable struggle. Because if you don't enjoy what you do, then you're paying a hell of a price. A hell of a price. So business is to be enjoyed, not enjoyed. Or should I say, life is to be enjoyed, not enjoyed. Because business is simply part of life. That's all it is. Frank and I were talking about it this morning. You get people complaining about their work. You know, got this to do, got that to do, got this to do. Well, how about, uh, you know, you get rid of yourself or something. Yeah. You know, getting the social security numbers, getting IDs, you know, getting a driver's license because I can't. Uh, we live in California, so uh, I, can't, uh, I can't own a car unless I've got a driver's license. Or, you know, it's just one thing after another. You've got you to adapt to and so forth. But anyway, we've been learning to adapt, so there you go. And then, two Fridays ago, our stuff arrived from Australia big container of stuff because we sent it on 
December the 15th, and you've heard about all the stuff held up at the docks? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, our, our tiny container, relatively speaking, was held up as well. So I was delighted that it arrived, especially as I had missed my wife enormously. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, I could, have, I, had missed her. I could have missed her. She's okay. She needs to be revived. But that's not the point. The point is you've got to save money. You've got to cut back. No, so well, she was delighted, and uh, so yeah, so we're settling into life uh, in America, learning the American way. Very impressed, generally speaking. Anyway, so today the idea was that we'd have a talk about business, and I, I'm, you know, you, I, I'm just a student of business. I'm not a teacher of business. I am what I hope you are. I hope you're a, a learner, someone who's keen to learn. We're going to spend all our lives in business, by the way. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> all our lives. Um, and some people say, well, what does that mean? You know, I'm hoping to retire one day. No, 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 you, you can do that because that's your decision. Uh, but you can never leave the world of business because we live in a sort of a business society. I don't mean it's the most important thing in our lives, but it's a very important part of our lives. So, for instance, if you do retire, you will remain a customer of other businesses, will you not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll have an interest in how business is conducted. You will have or you will have children already. And grandchildren, they will inevitably go into the world of business. So what are you going to do about that? Are you going to, are you going to help them to have a better attitude about business? Or are you going to tell them, get in, make a buck, and get out? And that's what a lot of people do. Someone said to me recently, the main reason I'm in business is so I can make money. I said, oh, okay. For what reason? Uh, so I can get out of business. <laughs> that's heartening to hear. So that's the kind of nonsense that you hear, you know, that we're going to be in business all our lives. Okay? Now, the basis of your business is to help me. And the basis of my business is to help you. I hope you don't get a uh, complicated more than that. The only real question, and we'll examine this today, is what does help mean? Because it isn't simply having shoes. It isn't simply being prepared to give service. Because the consumer believes they can get that anywhere. And in fact, that is an entitlement of theirs. They can get it anywhere. The question is, how do you help them in areas where they don't ask for help? And I don't mean to getting involved in anything complicated. I mean. You know, is it possible that what consumers need is different to what they say they want? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'll repeat the question. Is it possible that they need help beyond what they say they want? Yes. yes. Okay, well, that's a good organization studies that on an ongoing basis. And I don't mean it's the same for everybody. It's not the same for everybody. But the same principle applies is that people need help. Now, if you go to the doctor, the doctor knows you don't know, don't they? They know that you don't know. They know that all you have to talk about is a symptom. That's it. Tell me when the last time you went to a doctor and said, hello doctor, my left ventricle is malfunctioning. <laughs> also, uh, my liver is interacting negatively with my kidney. Uh, the lower lobe of my left lung doesn't feel right. And guess what, doc? My esophagus is just picked up, packed up. You can't speak that language. And they know you can't speak that language. You speak the language of symptoms. So the only kind of thing that you can say is, doctor, yes? Every time I do that, it hurts. Don't do that, not yours. <laughs> so, so today, uh, in the short time that we've got, we're going to examine uh, people, people at the basis of business, whether they're managers, staff, part-time, full-time, people at the basis of business. We're going to study consumers, they're people too. Are they not? Mm -hmm. yes? yes. Or do they go home at night to consumer land? Yes. No? Okay, so they're people too. And uh, we'll start with just a basic look at people in business. So people in business form themselves into a human pyramid. So, so there's all the people in business. And you are in there somewhere, and I'm in there somewhere. <clears throat> That's the human pyramid. Then you get to see all of the results generated by people. Now when I say results, what most people think I mean in business is dollars and cents, and that's obviously a key result, but that's not the first result, okay? There are four results that I think any business ought to be concerned about. The first result is our customers getting more out of us every year than they did the year before. This means that you're in the business of progress. You're not in the business of change. So don't talk about change because it bores the pants off people. Um, they're not interested in change. They're only interested in progress. Oh, and by the way, the good news is you can't have progress without change. So progress is the goal, change is the strategy. You know, we don't go around talking about strategy before we talk about a goal. So, you know, in other words, you either want to get better or you don't. If you want to get better, then you're going to have to change. 
But if on the other hand you just talk to people about change, you threaten to rearrange what they've become comfortable with. So don't do that. Don't do it with customers, don't do it with staff. So the first result in any business is, do customers get more out of us every year than they did the year before? Now, if that doesn't happen, then you will have two problems. Number one, you will not make the level of sales and have the level of patronage that you want. And number two, there'll be no complaints from the customers because they don't know anything about this rule. Nothing. If they get it, if they get more out of you, they love it. They will spend more, they'll come back, and they'll send other people to see you. But if they don't get it, they won't complain, okay? Because they don't know what it's all about. It's not their job to know what it's all about, it's our job. So that's the first result in any business. Second result is that the staff of the business will succeed one way or the other. Uh, they have to succeed. The whole idea of having an entrepreneurial spirit, if that only exists with management, but not with staff, then it's laughable as far as I'm concerned. So in a good business, one way or another, the staff, no matter what they do, by the way, whether they're on the floor, background, doesn't matter, the staff have an opportunity to be successful where they are, not where they might be in the future. In most businesses, and nobody means for this to happen, the only way for staff to get on is to get out. To get out of the job they're in, or to get out of the company they're in, because enough value isn't placed on that person. That's ridiculous if you think about it. In a good business, a person can get on in the job that they're in. If they do a better job, if they produce better results, etc beyond the job description and so forth. Third result is that the business does very well in terms of reputation, sales, profits, etc., market share, whatever, whatever matters to you. And, uh, and uh, the, the fourth result is that you just simply you know, keep on getting better as a team, etc. Well, on a day like this, we are reminded that very few people and very few businesses generate most of the results. I'm sure that's not a big surprise. I'm not talking about big business up here, by the way. I'm just talking about progressive businesses. So here you've got very small businesses, medium-sized businesses, some very large businesses exist up here. Many large businesses in America and all over the world reside at the base of the pyramid. Don't make any money at all. They're an embarrassment from a service point of view. Hopeless. So, you know, big business isn't necessarily a successful business. So here you have some very, you have one-man bands here, all the way up to small, medium, large businesses, and so forth. These people are fat, thin, tall, small, young, old, female, male, different colors, different ethnic backgrounds. There's absolutely nothing external about these people that would give you to understand why they are successful. It's an internal job, or as we said for today's title, success is an inside job. It is for individuals, and it is for a business too. So some of these people were very fortunate to go to university, some of them left school at a tender age, but they remain students of business all their life. They're always learning. Not for the sake of learning, but for the sake of passing in information on. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put some emphasis on it. You've heard the saying, knowledge is? Oh, there you go. It never has been and never will be. I, I know we've been told that, but you know, not everything we've been told is true. I don't mean anybody meant to tell us lies, but there's a lot of nonsense in business and life. N knowledge is not power. Giving knowledge is power. Okay, That's power, not having it. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to those you serve, inside the business or outside the business. Giving knowledge is power. So now, if you buy that, if you buy that idea that giving is knowledge, and don't tell me you don't understand that principle, or I'll have you analyzed. <laughs> because you already know about it if you've got children, yes? Do you hold back from giving knowledge to children? No. no. You give knowledge to children. If you give knowledge, then the next question is, what kind of knowledge do you give? That raises a very important in, in, in point. What kind of knowledge do you give? Do you give basic product knowledge, or do you give knowledge that will help the individual, the person? How do you give the knowledge, which is the art of communication? How are you going to give the knowledge? You can't say to someone, uh, do you have time to talk about this? What will I say? No, so that's the end of that. So you can't, you stop from giving knowledge. Don't ask permission to do your job. If you've got valuable knowledge to give to people, don't ask permission to do it. Get on with it and do it. I don't mean to impose yourself on people, but give the knowledge in an interesting way. <laughs> so, so these people here are givers of knowledge. Um, they, uh, as I said, are, you know, in every, every way they're completely uh, different. Uh, some of these people are uh, very outgoing in personality, you know, very gregarious and 
confident and what have you. But most of the people I meet up here, very seriously, very quiet people. They just don't need to be noisy because they're valuable. See, once you're valuable, you don't need to be noisy. You don't need to go around, you know, with the gift of the gap, all the nonsense that goes on in sales. Because I was raised in sales. And basically the message to me was, I'd better be jumpy. I'd better be noisy. Hi there, how you doing? You know, all this kind of nonsense. Like as if that's going to impress a customer. I had a salesperson come to see me in the business that I had in Australia, only a small business, 4.2 billion a year, just small. And uh, I had this guy come to see me, a salesman, and he was something to do with office appliances. And this is how he started. This is what selling can be like if you're not careful. First of all, he had an Australian accent. Are you familiar with the Australian accent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's like that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Too right. Anyway, um, so he said, uh, G'day, Mr. Because that's how Australians. G'day, g'day. Uh, listen, um, got a question for you. What do I have to do to get your business? What an interesting question that is. What do I have to do to get your business? I said, would you mind repeating? He said, Yeah. What do I have to do to get your business? I said, Okay. So let me see if I've got this right. You've got no ideas then. <laughs> <laughs> so you have no ideas on how to get my business. So you basically want me to tell you how you can get my business. What an interesting line of thought. Will I be paid a commission on this sale to myself? <laughs> you idiot. So this is what selling is, it's empty, it's empty. But let me introduce you to a saying that I found many years ago. Unless some sweetness at the bottom lie, who cares for all the crinkling on the pie? So a person's personality and what have you is really just the crinkling. What they want to know is, can you be valuable or not? Now, to simplify this, most of the doctors you've ever met, are they noisy or quiet? Quiet. quiet. They don't need to be noisy. Okay? <laughs> they know what they're talking about, and they give their knowledge. Have you also noticed that when you go to the doctors, they don't say things like, oh, uh, by the way, um, would you like your blood pressure taken? <laughs> are you in the mood? <laughs> do you have time for it? How do you feel about the concept of blood? They don't do that. What do they do? Take your blood pressure. They take your blood pressure. Okay, that's the end of that. So you've got a job to do, do it. Okay, if it's designed to help people, do it. But in most businesses, it hasn't been designed. In most businesses, the standard of service is based on the person who's giving the service. Okay, so you could have eight people giving service and they've got eight different standards. Oh, that's very bad. And the worst thing you'll ever hear in any business is where someone in sales or any kind of business says, usually in a conspiratorial whisper, um, I've got my own way of selling. <laughs> really? Is that why you're 30% behind? So you have to be very careful about that. Good business sets standards. You sell shoes that have been made to a standard? Yes? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so then have service that's made to a standard. I don't mean, I don't mean clinical, boring standards. I mean very interesting standards. The higher the better. So, these people also understand the dictionary definition of the word winning, which of course is known to all athletes, but not to many business people. The dictionary definition of the word winning is progress through struggle. It isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be tough, okay? It's like anything. Being a parent, piece of cake, no, it's tough. Being married, tough. Well, I ought to know. <laughs> Everywhere we go, I introduce my wife, as my first wife, just to keep her on her toes. <laughs> <laughs> so, progress through struggle. However, I would add an additional word to that, progress through enjoyable struggle. Because if you don't enjoy what you do, then you're paying a hell of a price. A hell of a price. So business is to be enjoyed, not endured. Or should I say, life is to be enjoyed, not enjoyed. Because business is simply part of life. That's all it is. Frank and I were talking about it this morning. You get people complaining about their work. You know, you got this to do, or that to do, you got this to do. Well, how about, uh, you know, you get rid of yourself or something. Yeah? They're just ordinary people living in the same place as everybody else is. How come they're successful? What do you think? And not everyone at the same time, by the way. Yeah, they have to want it. Pardon? They want it to be successful. Well, yeah, they want to do it, yeah. Attitude. Pardon? Attitude. Yes, absolutely. So what do we mean by attitude? What do we, what is, what does that issue mean? Your perception on life. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, one person sees this, another person sees that. Like the old story of the guy that was sitting on the top of a hill, he was an old gentleman, and he was just sitting on a, like a bench, and he was overlooking a little township down below. And a guy, a young guy, came up to him and he said, um, excuse me, uh, what's, what's the township? What are the people like in that township? He said, are you, are you moving here? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, where have you come from? And he said, oh, and he told him. He said, okay, what are the people like that? He said, terrible, very suspicious people, very <laughs> inward, you know, not, not trustworthy. And he said, well, unfortunately, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same down there. He said, really? He said, yeah, okay. About an hour later, another young guy came through and same thing happened. He said, what are the people like down there? He said, where are you from? He told him. He said, what are the people like that? He said, fantastic, great people, wonderful people, helpful people. He said, that's what they're like down there. So it's the, way, it's the way you treat people, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. okay? You go looking for the best in people, and you will find, even if it's only for the time that you're with them, you know, a comedian doesn't have responsibility for whether people laugh after a show, does he or she? No. They're only doing the show. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with our kids and what have you. We've just we've got to do our best, knowing that our job is to try and help them in some way. And as I've said, there's a lot of nonsense in business. I still keep getting asked questions like, do you think salespeople are boring? I said, well, I think it helps. <laughs> I do think it helps to be born. Because if you've not been born, that's a hell of an impediment. <laughs> I mean, for a start, we can't even see you. So yeah, that's the kind of nonsense you get. People say to me, oh, I, I, I can't sell. Really? So you don't have any children? Sorry? You don't have children now, because if you have children, you've got to learn to sell. What are you going to do? Tell them all day what to do? What are you going to do? Ask them? What are you going to do? Parents say to their child, uh, hi, your mom and I have been thinking about the fact that you're eight years old now, and maybe it's time you started learning about the rules of the road so that you look after yourself and you know, you're safe and what have you. Um, so we'd like to tell you about it. Is that okay with you? Not really. I'm just a bit busy at the moment. When would be a good time? Well, I'll let you know. I'll get back to you. Okay. Can you imagine parents being that dumb that they would do that? That happens in sales all the time. All the time. People ask permission to do their work. I had a lady ring me from Diners Club not long ago. Uh, hi, is that Mr. Lees? Yes, it is. Hi, I'm from Diners Club. We've just introduced a new corporate credit card service. Would you like to hear about it? I said, no, thank you. She said, okay, bye-bye. Now, who in management is allowing her to ask questions of that nature? She didn't even explain what the service was. So don't go around asking permission to do your job. If you've got something to do, then do it for people. The question is, what is our job? So our belief at Bionic is, uh, and Frank and I were talking about it on the way up here today, is uh, we believe there are two specific gaps in business. But before I tell you about the gaps, let me, let me explain the concepts of what's called the value gap, the value gap. Quickly, just quickly, what does a restaurant sell? Two food. 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 Yes, okay, first thing you think of, isn't it? Now we're here in a meeting today to go beyond the first level of thought, because it can't be food. Because if it was food, it would be the most expensive place in all the world to buy food. You do realize that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, just think about it for a minute. Could you imagine people studying this from outer space? What would they say? What is wrong with these people? They could have grown that in the garden. They could have cooked that at home. But we're not going to a restaurant simply for food, are we? Okay, the food had better be good. Why are we going there? Experience. experience. Pleasant experience. Yes, are you okay with that or not? Yes. So what a restaurant sells, whether they're conscious of it or not, what they sell is pleasant experience. What they charge for on their receipts is food and drink. Yes? Yes. Okay, that's called a value gap. The distance between what a business sells versus what it charges for. So what we can say here today is that you charge for shoes, but you don't sell shoes. You don't sell shoes. You sell success with shoes. That's a completely different concept. And, the, and, you will, and until you buy that idea, challenge it, argue about it, whatever you like, until you buy that, it's very hard to be successful in selling. Because they end up selling shoes. And people say, well, I can get them online. I can get them online. I can get them cheaper. I can get them this way. They know how to buy shoes. Customer is a buyer. Look at look up the word customer in the dictionary. It means buyer. So you know they're looking to buy at the best possible price. That's what they're supposed to do. But the person that they are is looking for success. 
even though they don't ask for that. So we have to understand in our business, what is it we sell versus what it is we charge for. Where's the price of a book, by the way, front or back? It's on the back. Does that mean it's unimportant? No. Price has always been a critical part of business, but it's got its place, is it not? It's on the back. Okay, along with the description of the product. What's on the front cover? The appeal to the consumer. So you have to ask yourself, and in fact, I've done this exercise with companies, large and small. If you were to come up with a description for what this business offers to people, and you only, and like a book description, a book title, I call it the book title test, and you've only got, let's say, eight or 10 words maximum, what would you write? Now, you could say something like, we sell shoes. Thank you, sir, for that. Please stop, I'm too excited. Well, you can't use that. We offer shoes with service. Customers are not interested in service. Sorry. Customers are not interested in service. You say service is critical, but not to customers it isn't. You know why? Because to them, it's an entitlement. Mm. You're supposed to be pleasant and nice and punctual. You know, if a customer comes in and you're busy, they know what busy means, but they don't like invisibility. They don't like you not to look at them and say anything. What, what does it cost you to be able to turn to someone and say, thank you for waiting, I'll be with you as quickly as I can. Fine, it's the end of that. But what they don't like is being ignored. So customers have no interest in, even though businesses go on and on and on about it, customers have no interest in service at all. Why? Because to them, it is the first entitlement. The second entitlement is being sole success, and they don't understand that. So they will never ask for that, and they will never complain if they don't get it, because they don't know what it is, they don't know what it entails. When they get it, they <coughs> love it, they absolutely love it. <coughs> Frank mentioned that one of our services, um, under the heading of PS, um, one of our services is in, under the PS banner is called the external team, where you get to meet the customers before the shop opens, after the store closes, whatever. You only need about half a dozen people, typical kind of customers, older, younger, new, whatever. And uh, you just talk to them for three quarters of an hour, make it informal, give them a small reward for being there, do it two, three times a year, and you will begin to understand the language of the customer, because it's different to your language, by the way. It is, completely different. Um, the understanding of the customer, the ignorance of the customer, ignorance isn't bliss, potentially very dangerous. Uh, what they what they like, what they don't like, in service, in retail, not just shoes, but everywhere else. Are you interested in that kind of information or not? Yes. How do you think it might help you? What is it, a staring contest? I'm sorry, what, what was I mentioned that because if it is, I won. Sorry? And what was the question again? Sorry, the question was, what do you think you might learn out of talking to customers after hours, before hours? What they want. Huh? What they want. What they yeah, want. Exactly. What they like, what they don't like. See, customers are intuitive experts about service. And what I mean by intuitive expert is. <coughs> what did you want to ask? Yeah. <laughs> are you an expert on TV programs? Not particularly. No. But intuitively, do you know if a program's good or bad? I can take a guess. Yeah, of course. But I mean, why are you watching it? It's either interesting you or it's not interesting you, yes? Then you turn it off or whatever. So the customer is the same. Intuitively, internally, they know if something's good or bad. And they will tell you about that. <clears throat> so they cannot and will not tell you how to run your business. But they can tell you what it's like to do business with you and with other retailers, shoe retailers included, etc. You're either wanting to learn from that or you don't. Now we call it the external team because teamwork is impossible if you don't involve customers. They should be involved in the team. You know, you, you, you should be talking to them outside of transaction mode, listening to what they have, because they'll never tell you in transaction mode, by the way. We live in a civilized society, so if they get lousy service, they will never tell you in the shop. I mean, now I know one out of a thousand might, but most people don't. They don't want to cause a scene. So you either want to know or you don't want to know. So you then get external accountability. I take it you've already got internal accountability. Right? <coughs> that means results, you know, 
thinks the business is doing well, not doing well, and so forth. Um, every, every business has that. But very few businesses have external accountability, which is are we delivering what we said we would deliver? And only the consumers can tell you that. You can't get that out of your results, out of sales and profits. So, value gap, you okay with that? Yes. Okay, the distance between what you sell versus what you charge for. And an interesting way to test that is to do what's called the book title test. Now, most people I have done the test with, including people who walk around in pinstripe suits, is a description of what they do. That's what they use the book about. Uh, we offer good banking. You know, that kind of crap. It is crap. Who cares? That's not interesting. That's not provocative. That's not seductive. That's hopeless. So you have to say, what is the element of success that we sell? And put it in the language that they can hear and understand. And don't, and don't try to be arrogant about it. Arrogance could be spotted a mile away. Okay, so, so the secret of their success is that they see two gaps in every market. Here's the first gap. First gap is of a consumer to buy a product. Your market competitive? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Getting more so? Getting more so? Well, welcome to a situation that everybody's faced with. This gap, therefore, is absolutely full to overflowing. It's highly contested, highly congested, price-driven, often. Um, it's the domain of the customer. <coughs> customer, as I said, means buyer. So organizations that say we have a focus on the customer, and again, they don't mean for this to be wrong, but when would they say we have a customer focus, they're focusing on the first gap. They're focusing on the customer as a buyer. This, in this area, in this gap here, we are seeing what the customer wants. The basis of the word demand in business. Demand is up, demand is down, etc. Uh, in this area here, our job is to listen. In this area here, we're dealing with the past <coughs> and uh, we're dealing with just the way people have done things in the past and the way they do things now. People have habits. That's the first gap. Now, when you advertise and promote, you're bringing people in on the first gap. You know, you've got a good offer, you're appealing to the, to the customer, and they come in. You've got to get the customer. You've got to get the customer in. And then we kick into the second gap. Second gap is not access to product, it's success with product. Completely different matter. And in every market I've had the chance to study, and I'm not actually sure of any that I haven't been able to have a, have a look at, doesn't matter what kind of industry it is, real estate, shoes, anything. This gap has hardly been developed at all. But it's an absolutely massive opportunity. It's a major area of what's called potential. And as you may know, you should know, the word potential is built on the word potent, which means latent power waiting to be released. So it's there whether you can see it or not. You've got to look for it. It will not come to you. So in this area here, we're dealing with the person. Now there is no definition of person in the dictionary other than perhaps one that's to deal with the uh, the anatomy factor or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I have to meet her. Yeah, well, okay. She's in the container. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they spell it, contain her. That's <laughs> the marketing office, very clever. Uh. I missed her a bit because I did. Um, but yeah, oh, well, I think it's going to be I have Say a that again. discount, you know, just lower prices. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like for instance, I have a discount bodyguard. I just enlisted the services of a bodyguard from uh, discount bodyguard services. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so if you
you mess around with me, uh, he prefers to deal with things on a correspondence basis. <laughs> so you mess around with me, you get a very, very nasty letter from me. That's how he operates. Oh yeah. But it costs less. I can call that. So are we ready to go? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so now what questions do you have about the first gap, this, the first and second gap? Because um, most salespeople, I mean, obviously they don't mean to do this, basically operate in the first gap. So what this means is they'll listen to what someone wants, they're very nice to do business with, they're very easy to do business with, but they don't lead them into this area here. They don't know how to do it. Okay? Each person does it differently because we haven't set a standard on it. So uh, again, with doctors, they have a process. They have learned, they've designed the process. It's three steps. Listen to what the patient has to say, because they don't try to guess what's wrong with you. You know, they'll be there all day. They say, what appears to be the problem? We say, oh, I've got this back problem, or whatever it happens to be. The second step is diagnosis, and the third step is prescription. That's it. That's their job. And as I said, they don't go around asking permission to do it. Now, we've got to have a problem. And everybody's got to uh, operate by that process. And it should be a nice process for the customer. It should be nice for the sales associates to, to, to do it as well. It shouldn't be anything onerous or boring. So we've got to learn how to get into the second gap. So my question to you, before you ask any questions, is do you believe that you have a second gap with your customer base? Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is it large or small? Large. Okay. Why don't they say anything about it? Why don't the customers say anything about it? Why don't your competitors get involved? Because most of them won't, by the way. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't even know that it exists. Right. Because most businesses don't have a radar screen for the second gap. They only have a radar screen for this gap. The radar screen is, and Bionic, uh, like any kind of distributing company, will have a radar screen. Who are our customers? Which ones buy the most? Is it profitable? Do they pay on time? All that kind of stuff, that's a radar screen. You've got to have that. But most companies do not have a radar screen for this side. They don't know. So if your kid one day says, oh, look, I want to play basketball, surely, surely at some point you would show them a film of Michael Jordan or something, wouldn't you? Yes? yes? Okay, let the kid know how high he's up. Because the difference between up and what most people do is the second gap. It doesn't matter whether the kid ever gets up there or continues to go up there. We must understand how high is up. And I don't mean, you know, ridiculous up, you know, because Michael Jordan, you know, I mean, that's, uh, some athletes like to set ridiculous levels of uh, whatever, but the point is that this area here is, it's not ridiculous, it's serious. The second gap is building a relationship because uh, understanding and taking the time to show them why. There's a sales associate may say, oh, it's a waste of time, they're not going to buy it. Versus such as a orthopedal uh, bionic flip flop to a orthotic from Atrix, right? That, oh, they're not going to spend that extra money. But them walking out and saying, wow, it, that guy just showed me was unbelievable. And coming back and building that relationship Precisely. to then your. Precisely. Yeah. You should not second guess what a customer can afford or what they will think of. That is not your job. Your job is to provide them with the best advice possible. It's there. The customer makes the second decision in business. They make the second decision. You make the first decision. The first decision is, this is what I think you should do. And why? Don't hold back on the first decision. If you're not strong on the first decision, there will be no second decision. Can you say that again about the price? About what someone can afford? It is not your job to prejudge whether a customer can or cannot afford you or whatever. That's not your job. Because that's what happens all the time. I'll give you an example. In the industry that I used to work in in Australia, my background in sales was with the salon industry. Okay? Hairdressing. And uh, we supplied the hairdressing industry. Okay? I worked for a company you all have heard of. You heard of L'Oreal? Yes. yes. Weller? Yes. Okay, I worked for a company called Schwarzkopf, which was a another player in that market. Not as big as L'Oreal or Weller, Nowhere near as big. But in Australia, they were number one. Australia was number one. And in New Zealand, too, number one. L'Oreal, second, well, a third. Why? Because we designed a better service for our customers. And it was like bees around the honeypot. 
So just to back up what the joke might be, uh, we had some hairdressers, some salon owners in Sydney, and they went far north to a place called Queensland, and they were working in a you know, sort of a, a remote sort of township city. And they were trying to help the staff, you know, they were working in the salon, just trying to tell them, you know, that there's still more to the customers than meets the eye. You've you got to go looking for it. It does exist. It's only a question of whether you've got the ability to look for it. So they listened, but there was a degree of reluctance, you could tell. And then in walked this guy, and he was wearing, um, you know, flip-flops and uh, a t-shirt, shorts, and what have you. And they all looked at these people and said, why don't you go and, why don't you go and sell to him and see what happens? You know, almost like they knew already it wasn't going to work. You know, have you seen people who do that? Mm -hmm. okay, they use language like, I don't care what anyone says. Mm -hmm. So, up then. so in comes the guy, the hairdressers from Sydney started talking to him, listened to what he had to say, came in for a haircut, normal thing, skinny haircut. And he left, having spent a small fortune, didn't sell off. Uh, he had a, a treatment in the salon, he took a treatment product home with him, blah, blah, blah. He was a Qantas, <coughs> he was a Qantas pilot. <laughs> and he was, in, he was in his downtime which is why he wore the t-shirt. They prejudged him because he dressed like that. Mm. They think, you know, he's got no interest in his hair, he hasn't got any money. Don't prejudge customers. Okay? <coughs> very, very bad to do that. If, well, if you're going to prejudge them, prejudge them in the positive, not the negative. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I just uh, have a long question, but I, I think it's worthwhile for everyone. The, the, the opportunity that you're talking about is, I think, brilliant. I've never looked at it Outside the shoe industry, and uh, I'm, I'm a slightly chubby guy who has a very tough time finding clothes that fit. Okay, the, the shirt's too, sh too too big, too small. The pants, the, you know, I've got nar narrow thighs and a big waist. I've always thought that if I can go into a clothing store or if I can develop a business that walked in and I felt like I was in their hands, and they said, you know, if you're looking for a show, you know based on my body type, what pants and shirts would fit me. I'd try it on, it'd feel great, and, and all of a sudden my whole, I, I would never want to shop Absolutely, anymore. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. My, my dream for our business together is to do that with clothing. Yep. And, and to me, there are certain foot types that, that, that you know, I don't want everyone to know everything. If they do, then, then you know, we, we send people to get certified in Pedorthus if they're interested. We do a lot of that. But, but my dream is to have the customer come in and feel like they're in our hands and, and say, you know what? I have so many shoes that are made for your foot or your foot type and make them feel good about it because I think that is our piece. I've been talking, you know, I've been talking about this a lot in, in my own way, but I am the worst trainer, I'm the worst educator that, that, that there is and I don't know how to implement that because I think that's the value that we can add to the customer. We're not just about making money. We're about touching people's lives. We do a lot of outreach. Um, but that's that's <coughs> that's my dream. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. But I don't know how to do it. I no, but, the, but I think if you... You're uh, drinking, and I never forgot this. That's why you quit. That's why no, you quit. No, and no. And came back, but you quit. No, but... I, I, don't know, I don't know how to do it. I just know well, that... Well, you don't have to worry about how to do it, because where there's a will, there's a way. <clears throat> so if you decide that you want to do this strongly enough, then you will find a way to do it. That's about as simple as that. So, you know, today maybe sparks off something and we go looking for it and we design it. But it has to be designed. Now, when I say designed, I don't mean in a, uh, in, a in a sort of a weak way. You know, you design it so it looks that way. Mm. It must be that way. Mm. It must be that way. Which is why you have to learn how to do it. Okay, now... Joe mentioned before about a relationship, yeah? Now let me use the point that Frank and I were talking about this morning. I think it was just before you were pulled up by the police, wasn't yes. it? Yes, second time. <laughs> just, just, just before that. He was doing 150, something like that. It doesn't matter, that's the way we roll. Um, but what a salesman, what a salesman this guy is. You know what he did? He 
You know how the cop leans in the window and says, do you know why I'm suffering? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Frank said, and he had a tear in his eye. <laughs> he did. He said, um, I'm speaking because we're checking my mother-in-law responsible because she's just overdosed on what you use in tablets. And the policeman said, get this, it's coming. Here's the question that I asked Frank this morning. Which of the following two relationships, to use your word, which of the following two relationships would you least like to lose? You ready? Your local pharmacy or your doctor? Which one would you not want to lose? Any other sex on it? Is that it? So you, you place more value on the pharmacist than you do on the doctor. I'll look it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, self-diagnosis. Pharmacists are all damn much more money. I hate to say it, but sometimes they get more. Well, maybe they do. Maybe they do. Now, the reason that why most people would, I mean, you know, the pharmacists. Hopefully, you've got a good relationship with the pharmacy, the staff, the pharmacists. Because I agree with you. Some but in many pharmacies, they stay behind the dispensary. They're not accessible. Uh, <coughs> the doctor is a personal relationship. It's personal. And we're scared of losing that relationship. We're scared of losing it because he's got personal information about us. I don't mean to share it with anybody else, but he, he's got that information. But pharmacy, if another one opens, it's closer. We, we, we will go there because we know we can replicate it. So it's a question of what kind of relationship you have with your customer. I don't mean deeply personal where you move in with them or any of that nonsense. <laughs> but here you are dealing with someone you vaguely know and here you're building a special kind of relationship. But you mustn't, again, to repeat myself, ask permission to correct you must do it. <coughs> this has to be designed. That's it. So I told you earlier, or I was beginning to tell you, uh, that um, you know I grew up in sales and training and motivation and okay, so I've ended up doing that now. But you know, I've, I've had to navigate a course around all that nonsense. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to meetings and say to people, you know, <coughs> put your hands up if you want to earn more money. That kind of stuff. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help people. I you know, treat people as being highly intelligent and becoming more so. They're interested in this kind of information. You know, it's, a, it's an eye opener to say, well, okay, I didn't know that part of it. The reason for it is the competition don't lay any emphasis on it and the customers don't ask for it. It doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist, it does exist in a big way. So if you act on this side, then you will not only retain the customer, so the idea with customers is not to keep them, it's to develop them. The only way to develop them is to operate in the second gap. If you develop a customer, you deserve to keep a customer. If your idea is to keep the customer, then you've got to hope that they don't find something more attractive somewhere else. <coughs> so I'll give you an example of operating in the second gap. Uh, one example is uh, this just happened in our family. Uh, I was telling um, Frank this morning that um, my son-in-law is from Louisiana. He came to Australia to play basketball. He played college basketball in America. In Portland, I think. Very good player. And he came to Australia to play. And uh, so we got to, we got, you know, she, she met him and so on and so on. They got married. And uh, <laughs> so he, uh, when I first met him, he came to see me. He said, sir, because that's what he called me. Have I, got, have I got this? <laughs> I need to ask you a question. Do you have a problem with me being a different color? I said, why? Can you change it? <laughs> what kind of a question is that to ask of me? Do you have a problem with this color? Well, tell me, what is your name? He said, my name is Delvis Green. I said, well, I don't mind you being a different color, but you have to have a colored name as well. <laughs> so anyway, delightful guy. 
they have uh, four children. They live in Phoenix, by the way. Independent of our move, they moved to Phoenix in October of last year, so about two months apart. We haven't seen them yet, but uh, they're doing okay. And they were getting engaged, and I remember the engagement party, and my wife and I, because we had about, I think, 60 people coming to the engagement party, including 20 brothers. <laughs> I know. All night long, about six foot eight, walking up to me. You must be Mr. Reed. So uh, anyway, we uh, were having an engagement party. My wife and I put together a long list of items that we needed from the local liquor store. And I went down to the liquor store. A young guy came out, very pleasant young man. And this level of service stuff. Hi, can I help you? I said, yeah, of course, well, thank you. We're having an engagement party uh, tomorrow night for our daughter and her boyfriend, fiance. And um, I've got a lot of stuff I've got to get. So uh, he said, do you mind if I have a look at the list? He said, well, I can read this if you've got shopping to do a course tonight. Just come back in half an hour. And I'll have it all ready for you. I said, fine. Good service or not? <coughs> so I went back in half an hour. And uh, he said, um, <coughs> I've got everything ready for you. And uh, I paid for it. And that was that. I went home. Oh, he, oh, by the way, he also said to me, by the way, he said, if you drive around the back of the building, come down the alley, you'll see our logo. I've organized for two of our guys to put the stuff in the car for you. Is that nice? Yeah. Very nice. You know, very, very good first gap service. So I go home. The next night we have the party. Uh, <coughs> I'm the host of the party. I'm going up to some of the people, young people, uh, some of the men. Can I get you a drink? Oh, yes, I'll have a Guinness, please. Mm. I didn't get Guinness. Why didn't I get Guinness? Because I don't drink Guinness, never even occurred to me. But people are nice at parties, aren't they? They have something else. But it does make you feel good not to give your guests what they have. So I was going up to very young people. Can I get you a drink? Yeah. And then they were naming drinks that I thought were drunks. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even heard of the damn thing. You say you're a bit dumb, are you? Apparently I am, yeah. And I'm proud of it, too, by the way. I'm only trying to be smart on what I sell, not on what other people sell. And I guarantee you your customers feel the same. But I can't think of someone who should have thought of this. Back in the week, still. Yeah? Now, I told him, I gave him the list. All he had to do, lest anyone in this room thinks it takes an eternity to go from here to here, it doesn't. It takes a higher standard. This is all he had to do. Mr. Lees, I've got everything ready for you. Uh, two quick things. You don't have on this list any of the ready mix drinks that young people like to have. So when is the party? Tomorrow night? That gives us plenty of time. There's my car. Would you please check with your daughter and your boyfriend? And you let me know if you need anything else. And by the way, you've only got two kinds of beer on this list. So if you want something else, just let me know. Mm -hmm. That's all he had to do. But he didn't do it. And because he didn't do it, I succeeded in the store as the customer. Yes? Mm -hmm. And I failed in my home as the host of the party. So here's an interesting lesson for everyone in this room. <clears throat> the measure of you and I is not what happens when we serve a customer. It's what happens when they leave the store and they live with the results of our work. Yeah? That's a very important responsibility. And that's either part of the design or it isn't. You've got to take that into consideration. But he didn't do it. Was it his fault that he didn't do it? No. He works for the kind of company that's big on measuring results, sales and profits, and hopeless at setting standards. So that kind of problem can be fixed anytime you like, providing you know you've got the problem. So when Frank and I were talking about today's meeting, we thought we would raise you know, a couple of the PS services that we have. One is called, I mentioned it already, the external team. So, so opportunities therefore exist in the second gap, not the first gap. The first gap is uh, basically, yes, sir, sorry. I think that the people that come in, we should not be selective at all. It should be a variety. Like, well, we know what we kind of know. Like, uh, if we were to get feedback from the staff and say, you know what, Let, let's bring this customer in, I think it should be a nonchalant thing that, that it's open minded. So, the external team, you mean? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that because it, it could be probed and not really get the true answer that we want to see. Yeah, 
Yeah, and keep having different kinds of meetings. You know, uh, there's one lady in California who runs a business called Coolest Shoes in California. She just runs a small shop. But, you know, all credit to her, she, she organized a meeting, and our rep in that area helped to run the meeting. And they had the meeting at about 8.30 in the morning. They opened a tent. It started about a quarter by half past eight. She had already figured out who she wanted to ask, so she asked them. And uh, she offered a very small reward just to say thank you for being there. No big deal. Um, she had coffee and different things, and, you know, just like you do today, just something nice. And, um, and then uh, Ken, our rep, just simply started asking the questions. Very simple. And um, transform their business. Absolutely true. I mean, you could have you, you might say, well, they should have done this and done that before, but they didn't notice what the customer saw. They didn't realize what the customer saw. What it's like a new thing? member of staff. I remember walk, coming into a company. She was brand new in the office. It was an office environment. And she noticed her phone was really dirty. So she cleaned the phone. Everybody then realized how dirty every other phone was. So, you know. Fresh eyes, see the business in fresh ways, different ways. And that's what customers do. I'm sorry. What was the biggest thing that she found? Well, she had made a mistake of having had some boxes on the floor and different things because it suited her, you know, and what have you. And the customer said, 